going to read Matthew chapter 3. We're going to read the first, first five verses together. Who remembers last Sunday? It was about who? Who was on their, their journey with Jesus? Who was that person? Joseph. I remember the Joseph, right? Three different Josephs, and so we talked about that. Today is going to be somebody else that's on a journey with Jesus. And we're going to examine this journey. And I think there's going to be a lot of things that many of us, if not all of us, will be able to relate and understand how that applies. Verse number one, in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair, and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Then went out him to Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan. Can anybody guess who we're going to be talking about this morning? John the Baptist. Uh, the journey of John the Baptist with Jesus. I'm going to use the word today, and I would say that it is, or it was, radical. A very radical journey. If you go to verse number one, look what it says here. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness. Now some would ask, what are those days? In those days, well, the rise of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is getting ready to be baptized by John. He's getting ready to go into the, into the wilderness himself to be tempted. And he's getting ready to start his ministry. And so he's getting nigh to the cross. And so in those days, when Jesus was, get, was coming up, now John is getting ready to be the forerunner or the predecessor, if you would, to get things ready in Israel for Jesus Christ. And you see, we're going to examine this journey, but he goes to the wilderness. Here's what's ironic, is that John the Baptist is sent or goes to the wilderness, and that's where he is preaching. And man, many people come, repent, they get baptized, and this and that. And so it's amazing how God orchestrates this journey for John. Many of you here this morning are sort of similar, like you just want to live a good life and live a comfortable life, but all of a sudden it seems as if sometimes God puts you in the wilderness and wants you to serve and wants you to be faithful to him. And yet God begins to do something that he never did before, which you must realize, what we must realize is that God has a very specific, very custom plan, and my, that plan is often crazy. That plan is often radical. I would not have dreamt myself to be here. I would not have dreamt myself to have the family that I have and the things that I have. But the journey it took to get here was one that I would not choose. And so the journey that you and I have been on to get to this point today, many of you would not choose this journey but God put you on it. And that includes the good, the bad, and the ugly. The things that I did to myself, the sins that I committed, and the good things that I, all these things combined, and some of the just miraculous hand of God that just put all these things together. Things that people have abused you, have hurt you, have betrayed you, is also part of the journey that God has us on. This was a radical journey uh, that you're going to see John, John the baptizer, John the Baptist, uh, his name was not John the Baptist. He was called that because he was one that was baptizing, uh, the baptism of repentance. And he was baptizing and getting people ready for the coming, getting ready for Jesus to come. And so it was a baptism of repentance. And then later on, Jesus ushers in the Holy Spirit, and you have the baptism of Christ. Then you have the baptism also of the Spirit. And so we're going to get to that probably a little later here today. Now, John, the name means Jehovah is a gracious giver. Jehovah is a gracious giver. If you remember Zacharias and Elizabeth, when, they were, when he found that she was pregnant, didn't believe it, and he was not able to speak. I remember the story there, not able to speak for nine months, and it was there at the birth, and uh, they're getting ready to name, and they're getting ready to name him Zacharias, and he says, no, 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 uh, writes it down, his name is John, then he's able to speak, his name is John. 
The angel said his name was going to be John. Very specific reason why his name was. This was all a part of John's journey. uh, That God, even from his conception, had plans and had a name design. and had a very specific route, if you will, journey through life. And it was a great gift. It was a gracious gift that there was a forerunner for the Son of God. John made some bold proclamations about Jesus, saying he is the one that's going to take away the sins of the world. John made some bold uh, sermons about righteousness and about sin. And uh, and then Jesus even says this about John, among those that are born of women, there's not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. John the Baptist's journey was radical, but yet unique. Crazy. Crazy yet powerful. The journey is an example for every single one of us here today. If you think I can't be John the Baptist, you're probably right. You're not going to be out there in Judean desert uh, with camel's hair eating locusts and wild honey. But nonetheless, there's going to be things that happen in your life, in my life, that God has planned and you might not like. And so I was thinking about this and thinking about our church and think specifically of some of the things that many of you are enduring. Some of the things that you're going to be facing. So I want to just give you a few thoughts this morning from this text. His clothing was radical. Camel's hair, verse number four. Camel's hair and a leather, a leather girdle. Hmm. His food was radical. His meat was locust, the Bible says in verse number four. So his meat was locust and wild honey. His location was was radical. That was in the desert, in the wilderness. If you've ever been to Judea, to this day, it is still a wilderness. I can remember traveling those roads, hot, barren, nothing there. And this is where John is. Close to the Jordan River. Of course, that's where he baptized the Lord. And so it's all right there by Jordan, Judean desert, southern area of Israel. This is a radical area. It's a radical message. This is his message. Go to verse number two, if you would, of Matthew chapter three. And saying, repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He said, listen, I want you to repent. Later on, you're going to see they're confessing their sins. So he, he preaches a message in the desert wearing some crazy clothes, eating crazy food, and he's preaching this message of, you need to repent. A guy wearing camel's hair with locusts coming out of his teeth is telling me to repent. This is radical. This is, this is up there. This is a little nuts. Now look at the radical response. Verse number five, then went out to him, Jerusalem, and all Judea, and all the region round about Jordan, on the other, on the east side of the Jordan River. And so everybody in the Jordan area, in the Judean area, and in Jerusalem, and now when the word says all, that's all, everybody came, everybody came out to see John the Baptist. Everybody came out, we got to see this guy, this is, this is. Camel's hair guy, this is wild honey locust guy, this is repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Wait a minute. They've been waiting for over 400 years to hear a word from God. Since, since the dark, this is called the, that dark era between Malachi and Jesus, the New Testament. There's been over, they've been waiting for a word from God. And here's John preceding or forerunning Christ. He's on his journey, if you will, with Jesus, and he is preaching this message. Hey, y'all got to repent. Because Jesus is coming. That's pretty much what he's saying. Hey, the kingdom is coming. Make sure you get yourself ready because he's coming. He's coming. And now, what a response. Everybody comes out. Wow. Now, look at verse number six. And we're baptized of him in Jordan. Now, what's the next three words say? Confessing their what? How many of you will go to uh, the Jordan 
and you're going to get baptized. It's a baptism of repentance, saying that I'm going to turn my life and I'm, going to get, I'm getting ready for Christ. But how many would say, I'm going to go to this public area and I'm just going to go to get baptized and confess my sins? Can you imagine what it would be like if people come to get baptized? Okay, now before you do this, confess all your sins. How many say it's a little radical? I mean, it is, it, it is. And here they are, confessing this. This is more of an open public confession, and they're confessing their sins. This was a really big deal. Everybody's coming out. This is amazing what's going on now. There's, you could call it a revival. You could call it what you want to call it. But there is, there is a move of God at this point, and God is using John to prepare the way and to get things straightened out, if you will, for Jesus to arrive. What a day, what a, what a, what a journey, what, a, what an amazing chain of events, what an what a amazing response of the people, what an amazing turn that people want to see and want to know the Messiah. Now, I'm going to take a few things and break it down on John's journey with Jesus in many ways is going to relate to us in our journey in 2024, this summer, as we are journeying through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we're identifying where I am with Jesus and where Jesus is with me. I'm learning to know the love of the Lord. I'm learning to know his will and his way. I'm, learning, I'm just getting to know a lot about him. It's tremendous. Now, let me give you the first thought. Number one, that is this. On this radical journey that you and I are on, it affects our appearance. Here is John with camel's hair and a leather girdle. Definitely different. Known to be the, as the prophet Elijah. Uh, same, same clothes as Elijah wore, and so there's a lot of relations there, but nonetheless, it was definitely different. And say, Pastor, I'm not going to be wearing camel's hair. I get all that. But here's what I'm talking about in the appearance I don't believe is just in John's clothing that was uh, something unique about him. I do believe it was what he looked like. I, was, I believe it, had his, it was his persona. I believe there was something inside of John that was coming on the, in, out, on the outside of John. I believe there was something that he desired of God on the inside that was just burning. It was just a flaming fire, and it was coming on the outside, and Yes, it was clothes that was weird. Yes, his beard and yes, his hair and all these things. But I believe on the countenance. I believe in the appearance. There's something heavenly. Something different. Something set apart. When the Spirit of God begins to work, things begin to change. When the Spirit of God begins to work, things begin to change. When the Spirit of God begins to work in my life and the Word of God begins to be real and that relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ is, is just burning in my bosom, there's things that begin to change. Can I tell you what changes? The smile. The smile that was just there by, by, uh, by habit or the smile that was just there by have to be there or whatever now is a spiritual, jovial, authentic, unbelievable, glowing kind of a smile. The eyes begin to light up. As Charles Spurgeon would say that the eyes are the windows to the soul. But the eyes would light up. There's a glow, there's a sparkle. The, the steps, the way you walk, the body language, things begin to change and there's no longer that stupor and, and shame. There's now, as I realize I'm clean in the Lord Jesus Christ, all of a sudden there is a, there's an energy. There is a newness of life. There is, a, there is a change that God begins to make on the inside that begins to show on the outside. Amen. Mm. We say about baptism that uh, baptism is an outward expression of an inward transformation. And that's very true. How many here this morning say, I know that I'm saved. I know Jesus Christ is my, would you raise your hand to that? Boy, you know that. And man, amen to that. Amen to that. 
It's about who John the Baptist was. A dedicated, consecrated, called, anointed, set apart follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, Pastor, who, who are we here today? A dedicated, a consecrated, a sold out, sanctified, set apart follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know the attack is on those who follow Christ. There's, a, there's going to be the flesh that wars against the spirit. There's going to be the devil that wars against the soul. There's going to be obstacles. There's going to be problems. Some would even say, Pastor, my life was perfect until I got saved. <laughs> and after I got saved, I thought it was going to be a bed of roses. But I found out that bed of roses got more thorns than it does roses. And I feel as if I am in just a whirlwind of mess. I understand. He's working on me. He's working on you. It changes our appearance. Sometimes the heartaches draw us closer to Christ. The valleys, we experience his presence. It's there in those desert areas. It's there in those wildernesses. It's there when you feel as if there's nobody else around and nobody else understands. It is those moments when God begins to change our visage. He begins to change who I am. It was Job in his valley. After seven days, his friends, his three friends come to visit him. And the Bible says they could barely recognize who he was because of the change of that heartache that affected him as a person. Secondly, and I would say this, not only is there a change or a, it affects our appearance, but secondly, I see the humility in the journey. I see the humility. He eats locusts and wild honey. It was Jesus who said in Matthew chapter 8, verse number 20, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. It was John in the wilderness just kind of living as a gypsy, if you will, having no place as a home either. And you recognize this is a very humble call. The diet is very humble. The clothing is very humble. His location is very humble. And sometimes God will change things in our lives to permit humility. Pastor, I lost, I lost my job. I'm not able to sustain my lifestyle. I have to down, I have to just, certain things have happened in my life. And sometimes things happen. I can't explain all that. But God allows humility, and that's okay. The humility under the mighty hand of God, he says he'll exalt you in due time. And so I recognize that humility is okay. Some things that have happened, maybe even sin, and it's been exposed, and you're very regretful or maybe embarrassed or guilty somewhat. And as God continues to forgive and continues to love you, it produces humility. The things that have happened against us from others, again, produce these things, and so I see that in John. I see that in our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Why would the Son of Man come Born in a stable. Again, why would he become and born in a lowly peasant's home? Why not in the royal palace? And again, the lessons of humility. The journey of John with Jesus is a journey of humility. It's a journey of how it affects us in our appearance and how it affects us in our persona. Thirdly, I would say this. God stirs up. I read that wrong. God stirs us up in our location. God stirs us up in our location. Look at, if you go back to Matthew there again, if you would, and look at what John, verse number seven, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance, and think not to say, and so John is now preaching a whole sermon. In verse number 11, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. 
That's what I was referring to. The baptism of the Holy Ghost and with fire. He said, now listen, Jesus is coming. This is going to be an amazing baptism. But notice how God stirs some things up. And John is fired up. John is passionate. John is, is excited. John is knowing Jesus, this Lamb of God, this Messiah, he's literally right around the corner, and he literally is. Now, I notice when this God it begins to work in me and you in this relationship with Christ, and we recognize who Jesus is and the journey that he's put me and you on and the things that he's called us to be and called us to do and how he's wants us to be a witness and, boy, evangelize and give out the gospel, he begins to stir my heart, even in the, in the wilderness he begins to stir my heart. In this location where he has me in York, Pennsylvania, he said, Pastor, can any good thing come from York, Pennsylvania? A lot of folks in York, Pennsylvania don't think anything good can come out of York, Pennsylvania. York is known for Harley Davidson. Used to be York Peppermint Patties until Hershey stole from York. 83 Diner. Listen, I believe God's getting ready and is doing great things in York, Pennsylvania. Amen. I believe there's certain, certain miracles right now sitting in this church, and not just in this church, but in many churches. But some miracles sitting here right now that are a testament to God's amazing grace. Uh, I'm looking at different lives. Now, I want to call you out by name. This would be, look at, these are trophies of God's grace. Look at what God is doing. Look at how God has worked in your life and in my life. Look at the miracles. Look at the health. Look at the deliverances from addictions. Look at the salvation from the pit of hell. Look at what God has done in my life, in your life, and has brought. Man, God is doing some great things in York. Don't let the devil tell you nothing good can come out of York, Pennsylvania. Oh, no, my friend. It is you that is coming out of York. It is you that's coming out of Dover. It is you that is coming out of Edders. It is you that's coming out of Mechanicsburg or Harrisburg or York Cavan or, best of all, Manchester. But it's you. It is you on your journey. You don't think, ah, no, 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 no. No, hang on a second. John the Baptist was from, from remote city, some remote town, living in the wilderness, wearing camel's hair and a leather girdle, eating locusts and wild honey. Who in the world is going to go hear him preach? God sent everybody to hear him preach. Whoo! Pastor, I'm a nobody from a nobody town. My, my parents are nobodies. My grandparents are nobodies. And I got a nobody job, and I'm just doing, I'm just living my life, and it's no big deal. Oh, no, no, man, my friend, it, you are a John. You're a gracious gift from God. You've got a special call. You've got a, an unbelievable life. Your kids that you're touching, the people that you work with, your neighbors, your family, there are, your, your church family, the people here, you are so important to God. And Jesus loves you. He gave his life for you. Oh, there's so, so many people just like John in this regard, how he stirs us up in our location. John begins to bloom right now in Matthew chapter 3 where he is planted. The deserted wilderness has no attraction. The only attraction in the wilderness is John. There's no garden in the wilderness. There is no waterfall in the wilderness, there's just a man on his journey with Jesus Christ. That's all there is in the wilderness. Hey, on Lauk Street, on Susquehanna Trail, on Maple Street, or on Princess, or on Maple, or uh, Duke, or whatever it is, the street that you live on, can I tell you what's so amazing about your street it's not the house it's not the fancy cars in the driveway it's you it's a person that is on a journey with Jesus Christ Amen. and that is impactful to a whole neighborhood and everybody comes out to see who is this radical guy on fire for the Lord Jesus Christ and this message about repent this message about the Son of Man is coming. 
This message about the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This message that Jesus is, we got to hear this location was not a very premier location. In Psalm 78, the psalmist writes this in verse 19, Yea, they spake against God. They said, Can God furnish a table in the wilderness? If you remember the children of Israel in the 40 years of wandering, can God give food? Can God give them clothes? Can God furnish a table in the wilderness? Isaiah answers, or God answers Isaiah. In chapter 44, he says, For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty, and floods upon the dry ground. And this morning, if you're hungry and you're thirsty, Jesus says, look, you can be filled. Oh, man, this is is, is an amazing day right here. Now, let me get to the point. That's all kind of introductory. But here's the message. God emboldens the speech of the gospel. It wasn't just the fact that John was there. It wasn't the fact what John was wearing. It wasn't just the fact of all this. It was the fact of what John was also saying. And he was giving the gospel. He was giving the message about Jesus. He was warning them of the one to come. Jesus told us to preach about the kingdom of heaven. He told us to preach the gospel to every creature. He told us to go and to teach all nations, to be a witness to all people. This could not stop the the early church under so much person. They couldn't stop the early church And under persecution, they preach the word of God everywhere. So here's what's important about your work in Manchester and Dover and your street and my street. And that is God has called you on this journey to be separated, consecrated uh, for this mission and for this journey. And the journey is to know him. The journey is to walk with him. And the journey is to now talk about him. And every time that I give out the gospel... In this, local, in, this, in this locality, every time that I give out the gospel in my neighborhood, every time that I give out the gospel, there's power. There's power in the word of God. There's power in a Christian who has the anointing, who has the spirit of God. There's, a, there's power with the Christian that is walking with God. There's power in the Christian that uses the valleys of life and uses the heartaches of life to be able to draw others to Christ and be able to show Christ And be able to talk about Christ. Oh, church, be careful not to allow the valleys and the heartaches to silence us, but yet draw us to Christ. To see Jesus in the words of God. To see Jesus in my everyday life. To see the gospel unfold in every area of my life that I realize that I'm living today because of the gospel. I realize that I am preaching today because of the gospel. You and I are sitting here today because of the gospel. (coughs) Excuse me. And the grace of God. And man, when I open my mouth and I begin to speak. Again, I was talking with David Gibbs and he said, please tell the church. Tell the church. I am so sorry. And please tell the church we we do not have much time. His exact words. We do not have much time. If we only knew, he says, our nation, in his exact words, I wish he could be here to tell you, because the way he says it, he's anointed, for sure. I've heard him all my life, and he is a just unbelievable speaker. But he says, Bill, please tell them, we do not have much time. Our nation is in trouble. If you think that this next, his exact words, if you think this next election is going to fix America, you are sadly mistaken. You do need to vote, but it's not going to be the savior of America, whoever whoever the next president is going to be. What is going to save this nation, what is going to save this country is going to be the churches that get on fire for the gospel of Jesus Christ. The churches who are able to speak plainly the gospel and give the gospel to a lost and dying world and realize we eat, drink, and breathe the gospel. I wake up to the gospel. It is not just being saved. It is the totality of the good news of Jesus Christ. That is from the death, burial, and resurrection to my salvation, to my sanctification, to one day my glorification. That's all the gospel. And I cannot wait to tell somebody 
about Jesus. Yesterday, giving out tracts and telling folks and telling about Jesus and how important he is. And man, it's awesome. Church, do you know that you are the hope of your county? And churches like this are the hope of your county. Which means this, you are the shining beacon of hope. You, me. Man, isn't that awesome? So you and I get to walk around saying, man, listen, I know I'm the hope of the, wait a minute, but pastor, I got the problems. No, 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 you don't have the problems. You're saved. You know Christ is your savior. Those who don't, they've got the problem. Because eternity is a long time, my friend, to be without Christ. And so I recognize, wait a minute, even in my problems and even in my journey, I recognize I can get to know Christ. He begins to change me. He begins to humble me. He now begins to give power to my words as we speak the name of Jesus Christ and go and tell and share and witness and everywhere I go. Let me give you one last thought. God's methods are rarely traditional. How many would say that John the Baptist is a traditional kind of a guy? Just your average Joe, average, you know, Bill. How many say, no, he's not. It was very, very different. Even for this day and age. And as God's methods are very rarely traditional, every era and time, there has been a fresh moving of God's spirit. In John 3, 8, it says, and, and John the apostle writes this, and he's, or Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus, and he says this, the wind bloweth where it listeth. That word listeth means wherever it desires, wherever it wishes, wherever it wants to go, the wind blows. And you hear the sound thereof, but you can't tell where it's coming from, or where, where, whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. When the Spirit begins to move, it says, as a breath of God, we don't know when it's coming. We don't know where it's coming from. We don't know where it's going to go, but I know when it comes. And it has its, has its own course, and so I recognize that when God begins to move, and that fresh, that fresh moving, it's not always going to be the same twice. And how I got saved is not how you're going to get saved. And how I follow Christ is not going to be the same way you follow Christ. And now this church does what it does. It's not going to be the same as some other church does what it does. Because the Holy Spirit moves and it's a moving thing. It's a, it doesn't want us to stay stagnant. It doesn't want us to stay in routine. It wants to keep you moving. It wants to keep things fresh. What he did for you last year, he probably not going to do the same thing this year. Hey, what, how he worked in John's life, man, it was, it was unorthodox. It was out of the box. How God brought animals to the ark in Noah's day was way out of the box. How God delivered Israel out of Egypt with ten plagues was very different from the norm. How God used a young little boy to kill a big giant, David versus Goliath, was very different. How God used Esther to be taken, or if you can say kidnapped even, by the king, and then chosen to be his wife. And then she's used to save the nation of Israel was very out of the box. How the Spirit of God moved on Samson with strength like nobody else is unbelievable in that day and time has not happened again like with anybody else. How God moved with Solomon to be the wisest man in the world, again, did not move the same uh, as with everybody else. How God used John the Baptist was not, was not the same as he used the Apostle Paul or Peter. And I can go all the way down the list. And so here's what you got to understand. How God is going to work in your life is going to probably be non-traditional. Because this is the way God works. And how God is going to lead you on this journey it might be a little bit out of the box. It might be a little bit different. You know, when they saw Jesus work, they said, we have seen strange things today. Peter writes, and he calls us strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Yeah, there's, there's some strange, it doesn't mean the same thing, but it's, we're some str- So what does this mean? Listen, don't worry about trying to fit in. John the Baptist did not fit in. Don't worry trying to like be, be accepted by everybody else around. Don't, don't worry about all that. Just, be, just follow Christ. 
get a passion for him, understand he's called us to be just sold out for him, and recognize that when I speak for Jesus, there's power in the name of Christ, and I recognize that this life is very short, and this journey is very out of the box, and this is an unorthodox thing, but man, I'm looking for God to do something very special, and he is going to do something very special in your life and in my life, and that, that is to me is one of the most exciting things to see, and then you see the response of the people. Everybody comes out, wow. Yes, this was God's call, and yes, he was the forerunner of Christ. And here's what you and I are today. Everybody here is a forerunner of Jesus Christ. The church, the church is the forerunner of Jesus Christ. Just as John was in his journey, you, how many believe that we are living in the last, well, the Bible says we are, but we're living in the last days, right? Perilous times shall come in the last days. And all these things that you see listed there in Timothy, you, you see here today. Matthew chapter 24, as Jesus says, those signs and all that, we're seeing happen here today. All of these things, listen, it, it's, it's all here. We don't have much time left. So I recognize that I'm a forerunner of Christ. Now, in John's day, it was just John. There was one guy that was called to be the forerunner. But in this day, in the second coming of Jesus Christ, as he's getting ready to, to, to come back a second time, the church is a forerunner. The church is to get the earth ready. The church is to tell everybody, hey, Jesus is coming soon. Hey, I, I don't know when, just as John said, there's somebody coming who's more mightier than I. Hey, Jesus is coming, and he's coming soon, and it's going to rock this world. It's going to be unbelievable. You better get your life in order. You better get some things straight, and you better know Jesus Christ is your Savior. Who will go on this journey? Who will continue to follow Christ, who will continue to say, hey, it might be a desert in the wilderness, but it's okay, because people are still coming out to hear the gospel. People are still coming to know Christ. And where your life is, and how barren you might think it is, my friend, God can pour floods upon the dry ground. Don't try to jump, don't try to figure out some things, no, no, just stay right where you are, just as John did, bloom where God has you, planted and watch God as you draw closer to him begin to change things I'm saying amen to that amen. now as we take this journey stay on the path don't derail off the track but ask God this today God what is it that you want me to change this call to repentance right to get ready for Christ what is it you want me to change? This morning, if you've never put your faith and trust in Christ, this morning, change your faith to putting your faith and trust in Christ. This morning, maybe you're straying a little bit. Man, Master, Pastor, I've been playing around. I, I, maybe I'm not where I need to be. My walk is not passionate. I'm just kind of like just mediocre, a little lukewarm. I just just kind of like just, just living the thing. But I don't have that John the Baptist fire. I don't have that, that passion to reach just just to tell everybody about, or, or just my own life and my, my, my walk with God and my, my reading the word and my prayer life. It's, not, it's just, it's just I'm, I made me feel a little bit empty this morning. Say, God, put me on the journey where you fill me. Put me on the journey with the word of God. I want to surrender. I want to give this to God. And you have a radical journey with Christ. It's radical. It's awesome. It's what he's called us to be. It's what he called us to do and to be with him.